Now, it's been overshadowed both at home and abroad by what's happening in Ukraine. But the first round of France's presidential election is less than four weeks away now. For a look at some of the latest developments in the campaign, we can speak to Andrew Smith, a senior lecturer in contemporary history and politics at the University of Chichester. Uh, he's joining us every Monday, actually, leading up to the election. Uh, Professor Smith, wonderful to have you as always. Now, last week, we talked about the fact that Emmanuel Macron has been benefiting from the crisis in Ukraine, whether intentionally or not. And he said this week that he will not participate in a debate with the other candidates before the first round. What have you? What do you make of that choice? And do you think that it's a fair one? Thank you. Well, I think you know this is still a, a situation in which uh, Macron is essentially you know campaigning from the Elysee. His strongest trait that he has at this particular moment is the kind of presidential status, is his role in trying to solve these conflicts. Um, and so he can point to his, you know, his prominent diplomacy, as we spoke about last week, as one of the keys for this. Um, now, of course, he will be appearing in a, a sort of a, a brief interview format, not a, a debate, but a kind of sequential interview format tonight um, with eight of the candidates talking about their approach to Ukraine, which he's agreed to do um, on, on French TV this evening. Um, but you're right, this big idea of a, a debate amongst all the candidates is something that he's ducking. Um, he's got a couple of reasons for that. One of the first is he said he doesn't want to sort of um, denigrate his ability to be a wartime leader at this moment to uh, to speak with that voice. Um, but also he claims that it's about wanting to have a kind of uh, unmediated contact with the ordinary French people. He doesn't want to you know be clapped by people that already support him and all the rest of it. And that was what he was trying to do with that first visit to Poissy, um, his first sort of semi-campaign rally where he went on walkabout uh, to meet uh, perhaps spontaneously, perhaps pre-arranged uh, candidates uh, who, uh, sorry, um, members of the public who'd been sorted out in advance. Um, now, the idea of a, a debate is one, of course, we remember those debates happening in 2017, the first round debates. Um, they were, I think, probably of mixed success. Um, we had the first one with uh, the big candidates uh, and then the second debate, which involved all 11 candidates. I don't know if you remember, uh, but the, the second debate was something of a rabble. And I think that largely characterizes Macron's response just now. Um, for him, if he can remain a little bit above the kind of the to and fro of the campaign, remain undamaged by opponents who are tearing strips off each other all the time and communicate his message to the French people as one which is about leadership and direction, then that is his greatest strength. Um, his biggest challenge right now is to create something of you know, a reason for a second mandate, not just a renewal of term, but a renewal of that mandate. And so what we're going to see, I think, over the next week or so, we're kind of slated to see more of his programme um, by the next week, I think, is that... Uh, you know, he really needs to try and re-enchant. He was talking about re-enchanting politics in 2017, making people believe in politics again. That's what he's got to do, because most of his opponents are a declinist narrative, I think. So that narrative of what he can do for France and what that promise of a second mandate will carry is going to be the key element of his campaign, I think. All right, staying on the topic of debates, a right-wing candidate, Valérie Pécresse, uh, had a debate this week with the far-right candidate, Eric Zemmour. Uh, did anything interesting come out of that showdown? Well, it was a tough one because, um, of course, this is uh, the big challenge for Valérie Pécresse in the uh, Republicans, is that she is at one uh, on the one hand, trying to combat Macron, present a viable alternative, you know, a kind of serious minded candidate who can offer a challenge. But then she also has a lot of votes to win have been kind of poached um, by the much further right, by those who are less concerned about sounding outrageous or, you know, less serious. Um, like Eric Zemmour, for example. Now, um, it's a challenging debate because, you know, we've had a lot of uh, the narrative emerging around Valérie Pécresse's campaign is that it has perhaps lacked energy. You know, the idea is that her public speaking in particular has seemed quite kind of um, unusual in terms of its tone and all the rest. And there's a sense of it, her being more of a civil servant than a politician. Now, uh, in that debate, I think, with Zemmour, she tried to correct that a little bit, and she came out fighting. Um, she was quite aggressive, took the fight to Zemmour, talked a lot about his conspiracism and his various sort of, you know, his lack of seriousness all round. So I think really what she's trying to do is re-energise that. Um, of course, Valerie Pécresse's campaign is starting to head out into the kind of... Um, the homelands of uh, Jacques Chirac to try and find those supporters and re-energize and change the narrative around what is a campaign a little bit in freefall. Now, the same thing was true for Eric Zemmour. His campaign has been sliding. Um, he's part of that kind of... Uh, 
uh, radical souverainist, sovereignist um, kind of wing, which of course took him very close to the Kremlin uh, and support for Putin in particular. He's remained uh, kind of ideological about that. He's remained committed to that. He's shown himself to be quite, I guess, unfeeling when it comes to uh, to, to supporting refugees um, from that conflict. And of course, he tried a little bit of, uh, let's say, kind of campaign fireworks last week when he went to the bench and tried to um, take off the bench uh, Marion Maréchal Le Pen, of course, the, the youngest scion of the Le Pens um, who deserted the Rassemblement National back in 2017 and has been going through our own kind of political adventures, um, but now to return to support Zemmour. That seems to have gone not phenomenally. It's, you know, they remain uh, very committed to zero immigration, very unsympathetic and, you know, a very kind of uh, cruel eye, I think, um, on the response to uh, to refugees. And in particular, there's all kinds of conspiracism about where those refugees come from and what their nationality is um, around that kind of area of the right. So they're not having a very good campaign in response to the events that are unfolding, sticking to their guns in terms of that type of, you know, really ideological focus on what they offer as a difference. Um, so that zemmour Picrest debate, I think both were trying to re-energise a fallen campaign. Picrest perhaps came off a little bit better in that, but still hasn't arrested that sense that this isn't really a campaign that has taken off like it perhaps could have. Let's talk about the far left candidate, Jean-Luc Mélenchon. He's been rising in the polls. One of them actually put him in third place last week uh, behind Macron and Marine Le Pen. How do you explain his recent success and do you think it's going to last? Well, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because um, Jean-Luc Mélenchon has, you know, in, in all the elections he's stood in, he's been a good kind of candidate for having a good solid like 11 percent type uh, support. You know, um, he's always been that figure that will draw a decent share of the left wing vote. But again, he's always had that kind of role almost as something of a blocker as well, because so many on the centre left really struggle to work with him. Now, of course, the centre left at the minute, uh, Anne Hidalgo's campaign has been nowhere. Um, they will be lucky if they're able to repeat the successes you know, uh, successes of Benoit Hamon last time round, um, because just they look to be in such a poor position. Now, for many people on the left, because of that, despite all the kind of issues that exist around Mélenchon, you know, he's been committed to that kind of radical left uh, stance. And of course, that brings in at times few contradictions. He has been slow on things like vaccines in the past, sort of sometimes a, a little bit slow in terms of firming up his attitude to the conflict first in Syria, then in Ukraine. He has been a little bit more kind of conducive to, you know, playing that kind of line. He's been more um, supportive uh, of uh, the, the Ukrainian um, Ukrainian cause, you know, uh, less willing to kind of defer to the Kremlin. So he's, he's kind of tried to make himself a little bit more sensible. And one of the things that that's brought about is really the fact that he might be this kind of vote utile, this useful vote, a strategic vote for um, many people on the left. You know, Mélenchon's slogan is another world is possible. And at the moment, you know, compared to, to Macron, to Pécresse, he is really the kind of left wing alternative um, that's being offered. And so for a lot of people, they feel like if they put him in the second round, then actually there's a bit more in terms of a choice going on in that second round presidential election. I mentioned Macron's duty now to try and re-enchant uh, the French people's belief in politics. Macron's uh, uh, reign so far, you know, his term, his five year term has all been about almost depoliticizing things. What somebody like uh, Mélenchon does is repoliticize it, take in that divide, set up an alternative. And so there really are a number of positions where uh, Mélenchon is, is quite odd, I think, still in that NATO withdrawal is quite an odd one. Some of those souverainist positions from the left. Um, but other things that people will like, you know, focuses on, you know, um, social services, focuses on kind of increasing pay. Macron says he wants to raise the retirement age to 65. Mélenchon, lower it to 60. Those are appealing things for people. And so if he's able to win round that strategic vote from the left, I think he could do relatively well. And that's something I think he will be committed to trying to maintain. Watching out for gaffes, trying to kind of curry up to the, the other members of the left in that very divided, diverse thing. Of course, he re uh, got received the endorsement of the rather odd um, popular primary for the left after Christian Taubira um, withdrew uh, after not receiving the endorsements. So he is gathering endorsements. He is gathering support. He is gathering that sense that he could be a useful vote for many people looking for a left wing alternative to the incumbent President Macron. All right, Andrew Smith, th thank you so much. As always, we're going to have to leave it there. That was Andrew Smith, a senior lecturer in contemporary history and politics at the University of Chichester. Uh, he's joining us every Monday to talk about the latest on the French presidential campaign.